Oh, Jesus. Oh, we could never thank you enough, God. We could never praise you enough, Jesus. Oh, you're so good, Jesus. Oh, you're so good, God. Thank you, Lord. What a great day to serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God is so good. And uh, we serve a great God. We have an amazing church, an amazing pastor. Give honor to Pastor uh, Ethan for allowing me to, to minister the Word of God. It's always a privilege to get behind uh, this pulpit, this podium. Uh, so I don't want to take it lightly. I'm thankful. Thankful for an amazing pastor that allows us to get involved. Amen? Amen. It allows us to jump in and have a work, have a part of the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We'll start reading at verse 12. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you're there, say amen. Oh, that was only about four of you, so I'm going to give you a few seconds. While I do, I'm going to tell... Uh, how blessed God has, how much God has blessed me. I have an amazing wife, I have four amazing kids, and I just am in awe of how cute my daughter is. Like this morning, if you, I mean, if you just watch her and she gives me headbutts uh, as greeting when she comes and she, she you know, anyways, it's, just, it's amazing how God can just melt your heart. I'm so blessed. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Uh, 1 Samuel 17 and 12. Now David was the son of Ephrite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. He had eight sons, and the man, uh, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse, David's three older brothers, went and followed Saul to battle. The names of these sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn. The next unto him was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. David left Saul's presence. He left the king to go feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. There's significance in that. And I pray with the Lord's help, He will help me to minister the word. Let's just put our Bibles down. And ask God one more time just to open up our hearts. Lord Jesus, right now, we want our hearts to be open. We want fertile soil that, that you could just sow your seed in us this morning, God. Oh, in the name of Jesus, we come against any distraction. We come against anything right now in the name of Jesus that would try to. Uh, take your word away, but Lord, let it fall in our hearts. Let it stir in our soul, God. And I'm praying right now that you let your spirit work in this place. Let your kingdom come in this service, God, in this message, Jesus. Lord, let your words go forth, not mine, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I'm going to kind of set this up here where uh, many of you have heard of David, no doubt, maybe. A uh, guy, Old Testament, had some good things happen to him, had some bad things happen to him. But we've got David uh, who, in this chapter, chapter 17, is basically on the cusp of the battle that makes David, David famous. The, the time where he faces Goliath. We, we know this chapter so well. Uh, but to kind of give you a little backstory. Um, David was, strangely enough, already in the presence of Saul before that. Before David even slew the giant, before any of that went down, David had already had an opportunity to be in Saul, the king's presence and court, uh, because of his harp-playing skills. Because we know at this time, Saul obviously had disobeyed God. He had uh, stopped listening to God. Every time God would tell him to do something, he would halfway do it. You know, I didn't do nothing wrong yet. You do, you've done it wrong. Samuel basically said, God has rent the kingdom from you. He's not going to listen to you anymore. Just, you, you're done, Saul. And even at that point, the Bible says that God sent an evil spirit. God sent. So sometimes we have to realize God allows terrible things to happen in our, path, in, or in our life for God to get our attention. So as this evil spirit would come, uh, his servants heard it and, and realized all this stuff that was going on. He said, hey, I know this guy. I know a son of Jesse. He plays the harp amazingly well. Why don't you invite him? 
come, let them hang out here, and uh, maybe that'll help you with this bad spirit. And Saul's like, yes, go get him. Bring this guy. Uh, and here's the thing is, we don't know exactly how long David stayed there. A couple weeks, a month, we don't really know how long David spent time there with Saul at the court before all these events come later. Um, but here is one thing that's so interesting is, is we, we don't know why he went back. Because the Bible just says it right there. Because this is setting up this battle. But it says, David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. Why did he go back? Why did he go back to his dad when he's there in the middle of the king? If you're, you know, there in the president's, uh, you know, cabinet working, you know, your dad said, hey, come help me on the farm. Like, you know, here's, I mean, I don't know. Maybe did his dad send him a note saying, hey, uh, David, I need some help. And all these sheep are getting out of hand. You're the best one. Come on back. Uh, or did David himself just kind of out of his heart be like, man, I miss my dad. I need to go back. I need to help with the sheep. I've just got this longing. And either one, whether he just obeyed his dad and went back and had, or had that longing, we don't know why, but whatever it was, he went back to his dad's house to feed his father's sheep. And sometimes it helps to realize the situation in David's spirit. This is what we need to glean from. We need to realize David's heart in the middle of all this. Sometimes it helps us to see what didn't happen. Because I'll tell you what David did not say. He did not say, Dad, I'm too busy to come back home. Dad, I'm working for Saul the king. No, Dad, I'm not going to come home. Don't, don't you see I'm here in the king's court? David did not say, Dad, I've got a name to make for myself. I've got influence for the king that I want to gain. Dad, I'm trying to climb the ladder here. David did not say those things because David knew the importance of the relationship with his father. David knew the importance of that relationship. And the Lord has pressed this on my heart for this, for this word this morning. That some of us have forgotten of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Some of us have rose to rank in life, to positions, to a dollar amount, to where we don't spend the time with our Heavenly Father like we used to. Whether we've just gotten busy with the mundane things in life, whether it's kid, whether it's the work, whether it's the job, school, whether we're just caught in that normal cycle of, of all these things going on, have we forgotten our Heavenly Father and how we used to talk with Him and walk with Him? Have you forgotten your Heavenly Father that breathed life into your dead, dry bones when He saved your soul from sin? when he's performed miracle after miracle for you. Have we forgotten our relationship with our Heavenly Father? I just want to remind us this morning where our help comes from. I know it doesn't matter if we're in a pandemic. It doesn't matter if World War III is starting. It doesn't matter if missiles are flying in the air. If tragedy strikes, I don't care if you lost your job. I don't care if you lost a loved one. It doesn't matter as long as you know who your Heavenly Father is. If you'll just come to Him this morning, if you'll step back into it and his embrace, I'm telling you, He's calling us this morning. Just step back into my arms and be like you used to be. Because He wants to love us this morning. He's calling us. So the first thing that we need to do if we want to remember our Heavenly Father to walk back with Him is to let our Father take ownership of us. Because I want to debunk this little myth that kind of uh, circulates in Christianity. It's kind of dangerous. Uh, these phrases, maybe you've heard them, you know, I, I chose this church. Yes, I chose this church. Uh, I've chosen to be a Christian. I came to God on such and such a day. I mean, some of these phrases, I, I was saved on, you know? Uh, some of them are really incorrect. I got the Holy Ghost on, all, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> come on, guys. No. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit and you should remain. In verse 19, he says it again. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But you're not of the world because I have chosen you out of the world. We have to realize, you know what? Yes, I know there's a time that we're going to choose God in our life, that we've got to make a decision. Yep, I'm giving up. I'm going to church. Yeah, I'm going to get my Bible out. Yes, I'm, you've got to make that choice. But we need to realize what came first. God came first. He chose us. He saw us out there. He left the 99 and he said, you know what? I could use this one. He's lost. He's down. He's depressed. Come on. We've got to realize that our father has total ownership of us. We are not our own. 1 Samuel 16, 18. This is what's, this is what's so crazy. As, as one of the servants 
as, as I told you, that, that moment where the servants tell Saul about this guy that can play the harp. Listen to what they say. They say, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, this cunning player, mighty, valiant man, man of war, prudent in matters, a comely person. Basically, this guy must have knew David because he, he knew all this stuff about him. I mean, I know this really great guy, but he didn't even say David's name. He didn't even say David's name. He said, a son of Jesse. Why? Because people back then were known by their fathers. They were known by the, That's why genealogies were so important. I did a search last night on, on the eSword, on the software, that, the Bible software that I kind of study with. And I searched the phrase specifically, like this specific phrase in caps or, or in, in quotations, where uh, the son of, there, 1,000. Two, uh, 22 times in the Bible it says the son of. A thousand times. That's a big deal. Joshua, the son of. There you go. Come on. Levi or Matthew, the son of. Alphaeus. James and John, the son of. Anybody? Son. Zebedee. There we go. Uh, when Jesus said, Thou art Simon, the son of. Jonah, yeah, come on. Every time we keep every time they were recognized by who their fathers were, we need to realize that we should really be known by who our father is. We need to really be known. There, there needs to be a name that's over us. A name not that's not just on our driver's license, but I'm talking about a heavenly name. A, a, a name that's above every single name. Because I'm telling you, we're not our own. There's got to be a name on us. And this was this is so crazy as I was studying this. It's 1 Samuel 22. This is later, and I'm not going to spoil the whole story for some of you that don't know what happened to Saul and David's relationship. They kind of had a little friction uh, through the years to come. But this is what's just in searching some of these out. Uh, 1 Samuel 22. Saul's having a pity party. Uh, They've all conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son has made a league with this son of Jesse. There is none of you that are sorry for me, blah, blah, blah. The next verse. Uh, and then answered Doeg, one of his henchmen, uh, which was set over the servants of Zal. And, and he said, I have saw the son of Jesse coming in Nob. Well, I mean, even in the future, they still don't even reference him by his name, but they keep referencing him by his father. Right. Yeah. Again and again. They, they don't call Je David, even David sometimes. They just say the son of Jesse. Come on, we need to have a name that's on us that we are put on in baptism. When we go down, we go down in the name of Jesus. Why? For you are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. First Peter, for as much as you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb that without blemish or spot. Come on, do we realize that we're not our own today? If we want to have a relationship with our father, we have got to realize that he's, he, is, he has taken ownership of us. And we're not our own. Come on. It's already been, in fact, I think God is lining this up to help us to realize the significance of this through the songs, uh, through Brother Lawrence, just, just speaking this out. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Philippians 2, 9, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in the earth, of things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do we realize the power that's in that name, the, the authority that's in that name, and that that name needs to be over us, needs to be on us. Let's do what Pastor said a couple weeks ago when he preached good news. He said, I want to make the name of Jesus famous again. Is that what we're doing in life? When we go places, do they know us by, hey, yo, yeah, that's Johnny, or do they know something even deeper? There's something woven into the fabric of our being, the fabric of our conversation, of how we speak, of where we go. They say, no, that dude is a child of God. Do they see that? Do they recognize us as children of our Father, or are we just somebody else? Are we making the name of Jesus famous? As he's called us to do. We've got to allow God to take ownership of us if we want to have a relationship with him like we should. Because I want him to be the owner of my life. I want him to be the master of my kingdom. 
I don't want to just kind of do my own thing because there's so many people. In fact, there's, there's so many spirits that the enemy is using just to kind of uh, woo humanity to be like, you, you can be the master of your own life. You can do it all yourself. We can't do it all by ourselves. That's a lie from the enemy. But if we are going to allow him to be our father, we've got to learn to submit, to surrender, and to be corrected by him. Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the, fa- for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delights. Hebrews Whoever the author was, Paul, Paulus, who knows, who, but whoever God spoke through in Hebrews emphasized that again and even went deeper. But have you forgotten the scriptures that say to God's children, when the Lord punishes you, don't make light of it. When he corrects you, don't be discouraged, for the Lord corrects the people he loves and disciplines those he calls his own. Be patient when you're corrected. This is how God treats his children. Don't all parents correct their children? Well, he should. (laughs) Our heavenly father corrects us. And we still, or our earthly father, excuse me, verse 9. It says, our earthly father, this is Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and 9. Our earthly father correct us, and we still respect them. Isn't it even better to be given true life by letting our spiritual father correct us? Our human fathers corrected us for a short time. And they do it because they think it's for the best. But God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is holy. It's never fun. Verse 11. It's never fun. And I'm reading the contemporary English version. It's never fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it's always painful. But if we learn to obey by being corrected, we will do right and live at peace. With all the fear and turmoil going on, and I'll address that in a second. If we would just allow God to correct us, then we would have peace in our life. When's the last time you were really convicted by something? This is how you know if God's corrected you. When's the last time that pastor preached, you're like, oh, I need to stop doing that. I need to. Or maybe you're reading the word of God one day. Maybe you're just straight up reading and be like, man. Have you just been reading the Word of God and just kind of going through the pages where just, you're just kind of, you're kind of skimming? If you haven't been corrected in a long time, if you haven't felt that godly conviction, you need to check yourself because maybe He's not really your Father. Help us, Lord. I want that. I want the conviction. I want God to, 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 to slap me over the head sometimes and say, Come on, Johnny. Get it together. I want that. The Bible says we should want that. We should receive that. It's not fun to be corrected by God. But I'm telling you, you will have peace. That's what it says. It's his words, not mine. If we're going to have his name on us, we've got to allow him to give us a spanking once in a while. Correction. I want him to be my father. Amen. Now back to this battle. So war has been going on for a while. In fact, long before Saul and David, either of them ever got there, the Israelites had been under the thumb of the Philistines long before. So this was essentially just another battle. Um, and just like we read the first, uh, Jesse, he went back to his dad, or David went back to his dad, Jesse. And he says, you know what? Hey, your brothers are there with Saul. Here's some food. Here's some cheeses for the captains. Uh, go check on your brothers. See how they do. See how they're doing course obeys his father amazing Uh, and here's a side note sometimes there are physical and earthly tests that reveal spiritual and eternal truths how David loved and obeyed his earthly father showed how he loved and obeyed his heavenly father we should uh, maybe take note of that maybe we should listen to our earthly fathers maybe we should uh, listen to our earthly authority with all these spirits that are coming against our authority, our police officers, I'm telling you, that's an evil spirit. I know that that, there might be a bad cop in a thousand, but I'm telling you, it's an evil spirit to walk around because I know people that have it straight up against cops. When that, that they've already, like they're already kind of twitching when they get pulled over. I'm telling you, come on, we need to respect these guys. They had the rule over us. It's in the Bible. Pray for them and, and, and subject yourself to them that had the rule over you. 
Help us, God. So here's this battle. Here's this Goliath guy. You've heard of him. Okay, Goliath. Okay? Remember, we're, we're studying David's walk with his earthly father and his heavenly father so we can kind of glean from that. But there's always a Goliath. There's always a Goliath. Come on. So where Goliath is in this story, uh, little captions, insert your problem here. Okay? So whatever problem you've got. Anybody don't have any problems? Everybody's good? Or if you do have a problem, if you do have a trial going on, just insert that right here where Goliath is. Because your problems, your trials, your tests are all going to try to ultimately cast a shadow on God and his power. Just like Goliath did. Where Goliath straight up defied God's power and authority. Here's a giant. 1 Samuel 17, 10. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. He's straight, up, he's, he's straight up coming out and basically saying, man, you God, it's garbage. Come on. A bunch of losers. For 40 days he got out there and did this routine. You think day 23, they'd say, okay, he's done this for 22 days. Okay, let's just you know, kind of hide in the bushes, get some of our bow and arrows, and let's just take some shots at him. I don't know. You'd think they'd do something, but for 40 days he came out there and he just kept wearing on them and straight up defying the God of Israel. But here's where David shows up. David shows up. Here's his whole routine. Uh, and this is what David, when David got there, David spake to the men that stood there and said, What's to be done with the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from, and, and take away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know what reproach means? Come on. Oh, Eugene, goodness, right there. That's my first, yeah, right there. And when I looked up in the dictionary, uh, that's what it says. Shame, infamy, disgrace, an object of contempt or scorn. This giant was straight up making God's children shameful, disgracing them. And, ob- I mean, and now, remember, insert your problem here. Wherever, wherever your, your, your problem is, it, it's basically telling you, your God can't do anything. The sickness you got, your God can't take care of that. This problem you're having in your life, in your relationships, your job, all this, whatever, your God can't take care of that. And that fear starts to swirl. But here David, he walks on the stage, and he's basically saying, what, what is going on here? This giant is bringing a bad name to our God. He's talking bad about my dad. He, he, he gets a little bit, I mean, he's like, what are you guys doing? He's disgracing my father's children. And, and that's the thing is they were allowing uh, Goliath to spread this fear in the camp. Listen to this. Verse 24 says, as, as Goliath would say all these things, all the men of Israel, when they saw him, fled from him, for they were sore afraid. Sore afraid. Lots of fear. Does that sound familiar in our day and age? Lots of fear. Circulating. As long as you allow the giant in your life to stand there, open his big mouth, and cause fear to flow, you have now given control over to the enemy. You have allowed him to set the tone for the battle. He was calling his shots. Hey, this is what we're going to do. You're going to give me a man. We're going to fight, and whoever wins, that's who we're going to serve. If you kill me, he was wanting it on his terms. He was spreading fear. And if we allow the fear of our problems and our trials to spread into our life, we have now given the enemy the the fighting terms. We have allowed them to now take control to where they they now have the situation where that fear is just like a cloud over your life. You've given them the keys to your peace. You've given them the keys to your hope. They've taken your joy. It's all gone. If you allow fear to live, that's the question. Are you going to allow fear to live in your life? Are you going to allow that giant to stand in your life? Because here's what David did. <laughs> My second point, as, we are, as the first one is, we want to allow God to have ownership of us. We have got to now claim and take ownership of our Father. Because it's Him first. He chooses us first. We're, we're his children first. But then as we grow, it's like our kids right now. You know, it's like, you know, at first, you know, obviously we're taking care of them. But there's going to be one day where they, they, these kids are like, hey, this is my dad. 
says, my dad, he's strong. You meet up any of my dad, you're the strongest. That's right. We've got to take ownership of our father. And David said all these things. What's going to be done to this guy? That, that anybody that takes out this guy takes away the reproach of Israel. And as David is speaking these words, as he's, as he's talking to all these guys in the camp, it kind of causes a stir. Because everybody else is behind rocks. And David's just walking around saying, hey, what's going to be done to, to take care of this loser? And it starts causing a stir to where Saul says, hey, send for that guy. Whoever he is making this stir, send him in here. So David goes in here. And this is what's crazy. What are the first words out of David's mouth as he walks into the court? Oh, great king, live forever. Oh, Saul. He's, David's already passed all the formalities. He's like, in, in verse 32, don't worry about the Philistine. I'll go fight him. Not a big deal. Do you see any fear there? This is an 18-year-old possibly kid, a young guy that's just on the backside of the desert. Just playing his harp. And he walks into the presence of the king and says, hey, I'll take him on. There's no fear there. He's not afraid. Zero fear. This dude was crazy. Even Saul tries to reason it out. Don't be ridiculous. This is verse 33. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he is a man of war since his youth. Let me tell you something. Reason has no place where faith is in control. Come on. All these situations, you can't reason your way out of them. These problems, the sicknesses, whatever's going on in your life, you can't just reason your way out of these things. That, that would take away from the ability for God to work a miracle in your life. I mean, I mean just thinking about it. If you were to, um, if any of you have ever watched that uh, Deadliest Warrior show where they, you know, through science and stuff, they're like, you know, what would happen if a samurai faced a knight? You know, they lived in totally different areas and times. What would just happen? You know, they crunch all the numbers. They're like, oh, this guy would win. You know, what would happen if a mafia dude faced, you know, uh, I don't know, what, which one, an Apache, I don't, you know, all, all these different things. And so if you were to pit David against Goliath, all the history buffs, all the, the history channel guys that are on there, all the professors, they obviously would go with Goliath every time, nine foot tall. These huge, this huge armor. In fact, he's, you're really fighting two people because there is an armor bearer in front of him. That was carrying his shield. Every time they would have picked, if, if, they were, if you were to size both of these guys, there ain't no way. Even Saul says it. Don't be ridiculous. If we tried to reason this problem, it's going to, I mean, if, if we tried to use it with earthly wisdom, it's going to be Goliath every time. But David persisted and he says, listen up with his confidence. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or bear would come steal the lamb from the flock, I'll go out with my club, rescue the lamb out of its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. And I think this is the contemporary English version. This is definitely not King James. <laughs> <laughs> I will club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears. So David's pretty self-confident. You know, it's like, yeah, I could do this. I've done this. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord, here's where his real strength comes from. Here's where his real confidence lies. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. I'm telling you, we need to gain some confidence in our father. Do we realize who our father is? I'm talking about wonderful. I'm talking about counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, the commanders of the army of the Lord, a compassionate and gracious God, a consuming fire, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the ends of the earth. Come on, David knew who his father was. I'm not worried about this guy. Amen. That's why he, as an 18-year-old kid, could walk in there, in the tent, with Saul, the king, who the Bible says was head and shoulders above everybody else. Saul was probably six foot eight. He was, I mean, I mean, just take the normal six foot guy, five foot ten, if he's another whole foot above everybody else, Saul was a big dude by himself. 
And David, this kid, walks into the tent. Saul's there, all of his dudes that are just with all their armor on, and, and that are shaking in their tent because they don't want to go out there and acknowledge that this guy's been out there for 40 days looking for a commander. Instead, he comes in and is like, I'm going to fight this guy. Why has he got that confidence? Because he knows what God can do. He knows who his father is. Amen. Do you know who your father is? If you know who your father is, that bank account's not going to matter. If you lost your job, if you know who your father is, just get ready. God's already got one on that's coming down the road. He already said, don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your clothes because I'm going to take care of you. If I clothe the grass, the, 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 the birds, if I take care of them, how much more am I going to take care of you? Come on. Do we know who our father is? Help us, Lord. David sure knew. Psalm 65. I mean, this is David. This is a psalm of David. Where David says, by terrible things, this is verse 5, by terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are far off of the seas, which by his strength set us fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the sea, the noise of the waves, and the tumult of the people. They also have dwelt in the uttermost parts afraid, but thou makest the outgoings of the morning, and even I rejoice. Thou visitest the earth, thou waterest it. I mean, David's, through the, through the Holy Ghost, is writing all these songs about how great God is on the hillside. So how, how could he be scared of just this small, if God just spread across the heavens with his hands, if it was just a moment, he speaks the mountains into existence, how am I going to be worried about this little nine-foot guy? not. We need to recognize who our Father is. Because as these giants that creep into our life, they let fear loose. They steal our weapons. The Bible says that there was only a sword amongst Jonathan and Saul. Because the, the king and the prince of the land were the only ones that had swords because the Philistines over the years had had them under their thumbs where they got all the iron workers and they brought them down to where the Israelites, to have anything worked on, they had to go down to the Philistines. To have their plows worked on, to do anything, they had to go down to them. To, um, to, they were in straight up bondage to these guys. If you allow that to happen, if we allow this, this fear into our lives, for whatever's going on, pandemic, political chaos, countries going crazy, all this racial division, but if we allow that to get to us, if we're afraid to go walk outside, then we've already given it over to the enemy. But we're not going to be afraid. You know why? Because we're, we're prayer warriors. Because we're, we're children of the Most High God. We know who our Father is. And if we can just talk to Him, Lord, you're going to take care of us. You're going to take care of this country. You're going to take care of this because I live here and I'm going to pray over this city. And I'm going to pray, God, that you will work here. That your kingdom will come. One of the problems is, one of the problems that we forget who our Father is, and that we allow these giants to come in our life, is because we've forgotten how to worship God. We've forgotten how to worship God. David loved to worship God. In fact, if you were to ask somebody, uh, show me a worshiper in the Bible, I mean, you would almost go straight to David. Because he... Obviously, with the Lord, through the Lord working through him, wrote all these songs of praise, of worship. He straight up worshiped God to where his clothes fell off. So he had just a, a, an ephod on, his, his undergarments on. That's, he, just, he, he didn't care. He loved to worship God. That's part of the reason of how, I mean, if we are every day getting up in the morning, worshiping God, every day giving Him glory, every day singing songs to Him, come on, turn on KSP Drake, turn on your K-Love, throw in that CD, if you've even got CDs anymore. Uh, whatever, Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant, I don't care what generation, just throw something on and begin to worship God with it. If we sing these songs to God, if we start to do these things, when we come into the house of God, if we, begin, if we become worshipers, then we recognize on a daily basis who our Father is. But if we allow the work and the daily grind to distract us, then we forget how great He really is. But if we're like David, if we'll sing, if we'll sing out loud, I know these masks kind of like, oh my goodness, and if you need to take a little breather and come up for air, hey, I don't blame you. Because man, I was singing and I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, I can't do this. <laughs> you know, 
I need some, yeah, anyways. Uh, so if you've got to come up for air, hey, I'm not going to blame you for nothing. But here's David, who writes these psalms. Psalms 40, he has put a new song in my mouth. Come on, we need to be singing with these guys. I know these guys got beautiful voice, and you might be like, man, I can't really sing. People will hear me next, next time. Who cares? It's not for them. If you, don't, if you can't carry a tune in the bucket, sing anyways, because it's for God. Because when you sing, you're giving him glory. You're putting him back on the throne. You're making him, you're placing him in his life where you really are. How about Psalms 149? Let them praise his name in the dance. Come on. Don't be afraid to come on. Just, just, just come, get, get a little loose in the Lord. People come in here and they, you know, maybe they're not used to Pentecost. or like, man, these guys are crazy. No, we're doing what the Bible says. We're doing what they did. We're doing what David did. Psalms 149. I'm going to sing God. I'm going to dance. I'm going to give. I mean, come on. Do you want their scriptures to be fulfilled in your life that he turned a mourning into dancing? If you never dance, that's never going to be fulfilled. Come on. Don't be afraid to dance a little bit. Let the Holy Ghost begin to work. I'm telling you. If we do these things and we'll learn how to worship God again, if we're afraid of what people will think of us, then we have now allowed ourselves to be lovers of men's affection and lovers of God. What about David? Psalms, one, or Psalms 47 that says, clap your hands. Come on, that's easy. That's easy. Come on, we're, we're learning how to worship God again. Because David did all these things on a regular basis. He did these things. How about Psalms 141 and 1? I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice. For when I cry unto thee, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting of my hands. Come on. we got to learn how to lift our hands again. Let's do that right now. Let's just close our eyes. Let's just lift our hands across this place. All these, come on. This is how we're worshiping God. Somebody walk in here right now, they'll be like, these people are crazy. You know what? No, we're, we're, we're giving glory to God Almighty. We're lifting up His name. We're surrendering. Come on, the universal sign of surrender. We're giving God glory. Lord, it's all about you. It's not about me. God, you are everything to me. Lord Jesus, I want to, Lord, let a, a fire be birthed inside of my soul to worship you. Unlike I ever have before. God. And there's so much more. There's so many more things that David did to worship God. But I'm telling you, this is why an 18-year-old boy could walk in the face of, of the greatest warrior possibly on the face of the earth. And be like, you know what? I don't care because I worship a God that that's, can overpower you. I don't care. Here's what's crazy. <laughs> And the Philistine said, as, as he went out to meet him, the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? So David might have had a stick with him. I guess so. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So here's Goliath pulling into his spiritual bank. And saying, you know what? I curse you by all of my gods. By all of my heavenly fathers. Whatever they were. But David says, you know what? In verse 45. Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear. And with a shield. This other dude following you around. <laughs> but I come to thee. In the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel. Which thou hast defied. And this day the Lord... Jehovah will deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of all the hosts of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David is not here for his own glory. David is not here for his own, his own status. He's like, you no, know, you've defied God, and now God is going to take you down. I'm just a vessel. Come on, church. We're just vessels in the middle of all this. We're here to make his name glory. We're here to give glory to him. David called that out. And this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with the sword or with the spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into your hands. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. I hope I'm helping this morning to rekindle your heart and your mind to our Heavenly Father. Because it's, man, just looking at the statistics is just so mind-blowing. 
about it, there are so many different layers of tragedy that come with children without fathers. There's nothing sadder than not knowing who your father is or even not having a father or having a father that wants nothing to do with you. But I'm here to help you this morning that, you know what? Even if you don't have an earthly father, we have a heavenly father. We have a heavenly father that loves us. Listen to this, Psalm 68. Here's David again. David knew who his father was. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. This is verse 4. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Jehovah, Yah. And rejoice before him, a father of the fatherless. Are you fatherless today? Why do you think that when his disciples, Jesus' disciples, asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. God has given me this revelation and, and worked this on, on my heart for weeks, maybe even months, where we start out by saying, Our Father. Simple name of my message today. Our Father. Number one, that shows us that it's just not my Father. It's not just my Father, but it's our Father. Doesn't matter what nation you're from, doesn't matter what race, it doesn't matter who you are, it's our Father. And then we're taking ownership. We're talking to God. I mean, I, the Lord has been just working in, in my daily prayer. I was like, God, I don't, I don't want to be a fatherless child. I mean, that, that scripture that I read you from Hebrews, in the King James, it says bastard. So you don't be bastards. Allow him to correct you. God, I want to be corrected. I want to be your son. God, I, I, I want you to train me. I want, I want you to teach me. Come on, like a father that's out there. I, I mean, just think of the iconic picture of, of a father and a son out there throwing ball. Catch. A dad and a son under the hood of a car. God, teach me. He's our father. And here David is saying, listen, even if you are fatherless, he is a father to the fatherless. He's a judge of the widows. Verse 6 says, God settleth the celerity in families, which is broken down from the King James. That says, God makes homes for the homeless. I'm telling you, God takes a special interest in all the people that are marginalized, the people that we forget about, the widows, the orphans. God takes a special interest in those people. So wherever... Wherever you're at with your walk with God today, wherever you're at in life, I'm just encouraging you today. Listen, allow God to take ownership of you. Allow God to, to work in your life. Put him back on the throne of your life saying, Lord, you're my father. And if you're my father, Lord, it doesn't matter what trial comes up. It doesn't matter what need I have. It doesn't matter because God, if it's a financial need, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible says that he forms us in the womb he's the father of all creation every single person even if they have left God even if they've turned their back he's still their father as he formed them in the womb help us God to recognize that today if you'd like to stand for just a few moments I want us to take to take some time and with all this stuff going on, I mean, this is, you know, this, this past six months has been probably the, the most, I mean, with all the stuff going on in the world, I feel like there has been so many distractions that have had a possibility to draw us attention away from God, but not today. Today, I think it's time that we recognize who our Father is and ask Him more than ever before, Lord, I want, I want whatever you want for me. As my father, Lord, I want you to teach me. God, I want, I want to make your name famous. Lord, wherever I go, I want people to be known that that's a guy of the name of Jesus. And this guy loves Jesus. He's crazy, but he loves Jesus. I want to be known by that. David was known. This is the son of Jesse. I want to be known as this guy is a Jesus follower. Come on, is that your heart today? Is that your plea? Is that your hunger? Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter what comes in life. God, I want you to be my father. Come on, right now, let's close our eyes across this place. And if you want to come up to the altar, 
the up here to the front. You can come up here and talk with God for a few moments. You can talk with God where you're at, but just for a little while, just for a few minutes, I just pray that you let these words, these scriptures just work inside of your heart. Lord God, I want to be a worshiper. Every day, Jesus, I want to put you back on the throne. I want to put you back in the place where you really are in my life. God, no matter what, if it's just me, I want to wake up in the morning. I want to start to sing to you. I want to read your word. I want to be so consumed by you, God. Oh, Jesus. I want to make your name famous, Lord, in all of your earth. I worship you. Lord, you're my father. And just like David came against a, a seemingly insurmountable opponent, Lord, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter the situation. If it's something in our marriage, if it's a disease that the doctor's already said, you know what, I can't do anything more for you. Lord, we know who our father is. We know who, where the power really comes from. Lord, with you, creating us, forming us, God, you know everything about our lives. Lord, you, you know me better than anybody else, just like a father does. Come on, fathers. Come on, mothers. You know your children better than anybody else on this earth. Other than God. Just like God knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. He knows where you've been. He knows the tears that you've cried. Oh, He knows the people. He knows the lost family that you have. Whether the future is unsure, just recognize He's already in your tomorrow. He's already preparing things. He's already working things. Come on, right now. Just begin to speak out. Just begin to talk to Him. Lord God, I want you to be my Father. Oh, Lord, if I've left you, if I'm forsaken you, if I'm the prodigal son, if I've, if I've kind of taken your blessings and I've just ran with it, and I've kind of done my own thing, Lord God, I'm coming back right now. I'm coming back to your feet, Lord. I want to fall on your neck. I want to cry with you. I want to talk with you, God. I want to be there for you, Lord. I want to hear from you. Oh, I want to feel your embrace. Come on, right now. Let's just let God take us. Lord, it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It doesn't matter if there's unrest. Lord Jesus, as long as I'm in your arms, it doesn't matter what's coming. Oh, because you're going to be there with us. Come on. He's going to make a way. Oh, Jesus. doesn't matter if you don't even realize what a father-son relationship is supposed to be. Maybe you didn't have a father growing up. It doesn't matter wherever you're at. Come on, God wants to step in and he wants to fill that gap. He wants to fill that void. He wants to take your hand. He wants to teach you. He wants to be loving. I'm telling you, he's a loving God. He's merciful. Lord, I worship you. Lord, you're so good, Jesus. Come on, that's it. Take a little time. Just talk with 